Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Yazma Muhammad podcast. Uh, today, our guest is Madiha. Madiha is the very first Pakistani American um, physician that we've had on the show because we have had Pakistani Americans before, um, but not one quite as accomplished as this young lady. So I'm very excited to have a conversation with her about how she was able to accomplish that. Um, Madiha, welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very pleased to be in your show. Wonderful. Um, so let's start off with, because I'm really curious, you know, we we hear a lot about girls in Pakistan. We know how difficult it is to be a girl growing up in Pakistan. So we've, you know, obviously we're all very familiar with male Pakistani doctors. They're all over the place, but we don't meet that many female Pakistani doctors. And so I wanted to ask you about how you grew up. Was it in any way um, unique or different from the typical Pakistani girl? Just just tell me a little bit about, about your childhood. Yeah, um, maybe a little bit atypical because um, I was born in Pakistan. I was born in Lahore. Then my father, my family moved to, you know, Algeria. So I spent my childhood abroad. Uh, we, you know, it was an Arab country. Arab Muslim country. So we grew up there. It was pretty, you know, kind of liberal, secular back then, Algeria. Um, so we, I came back to Pakistan when I was in my fifth grade. So we didn't, you know, had the basic Pakistani primary education. So then I, you know, started catching up. And uh, so that was a little bit atypical that I, I was like little different than the other normal Pakistani children. Uh, but after that, we, you know, my schooling, rest of the schooling was in Lahore. And then I got into medical school in Pakistan and I did my MBBS, graduated, and then I moved to USA. Wonderful. And, uh, so I want to ask you a little bit about your schooling in Pakistan, because actually I discovered you through a post that you had made where you were sharing a picture of a Pakistani school book. Um, where it had like these, you know, little cute drawings and everything. And it was talking about how mom and my sisters serve us dinner, <laughs> you know, just like normalized, you know, the sexism that we're so used to. Um, and, and you were sharing those books and basically you were obviously incensed about how, um, you know, casual they are with their sexism. So I wanted to ask you about schooling for you in Pakistan, or maybe not necessarily just schooling, but the community, um, did you experience a lot of that sexism? Oh, a lot. In Pakistan, it is so casual that uh, you're, you don't even realize how the everybody is sexist around you, because once you get out of that system, then you realize, oh my God, it is at every, every level. Uh, sexism, the way girl. So the first uh, thing that hit me, I was a very, you know, kind of tomboyish kind of girl when I was growing up, uh, especially when I moved from Al Jazeera to Pakistan, there was a cultural shock. In Al Jazeera, I never felt I was a girl. But immediately you come to Pakistan, you're like 12 years old, your, your breasts are developing, you're like, you know, growing up. I was supposed to sit home and I loved bicycling. So, and I used, I loved playing cricket with, you know, all other kids, all the outdoor sports. But in Pakistan, the girls are supposed to stay indoors. And that I, I hated, uh, you know, I hated that, you know, and uh, I like literally made fuss about it. I kept on, you know, going playing with my younger brother's friends up until seven, seventh grade so I was like 12 years old and I was supposed to stop by fifth grade when you're uh you know 10 years old but I I was like a little bit of a rebellion <laughs> rebellious so I did that but I, then I very soon I realized like everybody's uh you know looking at me as if I'm not a you know pious or modest girl so then you know like I my we started having like these love letters at my home and, you know, boys used to drop me because if you are playing outside with other boys, they automatically assume you're loose and mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're out there asking for it. That kind of, and imagine you're just a little girl 
but you're reminded that now you're a woman, you're supposed to sit home. So that was end of that. Once those letters started coming, my parents, you know, and my parents actually didn't say anything, but I realized now everybody's judging me for just playing with the boys. So that was like a uh, first thing that hit me very hard. Like, no, you know, I'm different. I'm supposed to, why? It, uh, it, I realized it was so unfair. And after that, you know, you kind of uh, accepted your fate and then you ha you're supposed to cover your head when you leave the house. So I did that. Um, when I got into med school, I decided I'm not going to cover my head. I'm just going to, because I just wanted to be myself. So I did, decided not to. But even in my college, it was like basically male dominating. Uh, women are supposed to be, you know, shy. And, you know, uh, there was a, in my college, there was a library. And under the library, you know, girls, uh, boys used to, sit, like girls and boys would be sitting. But if you're alone passing through that area, you will be catcalled. Mm -hmm. Imagine in med school. So that kind of, you know, it, this sexism, you go you go in the market, you go to the bazaar, you know, you're catcalled, you're groped. It's so common. Every Pakistani woman has been groped or molested or sexually harassed. I... You will hardly find any women who has not been, you know, harassed or molested in Pakistan. So it is so common. Sexism, women are not supposed to be seen outside. You know, even if you are outside, you're supposed to, you know, be very careful, cautious. You're supposed to take somebody outside with you. You cannot just like go, I'm going to going for shopping. I'm going to the mall. You take your car and go. Maybe things have changed now, but at that time when I was growing up, it was like you have you're supposed to be accompanied by somebody. Yeah, I don't think things have changed very much, you know, according to what I've been hearing from people in Pakistan. I see very aptly behind you, there's a book entitled Men Who Hate Women. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what we're talking about here today. Yeah. Um, so it sounds to me like maybe your family was open minded, you know, what we call liberal thinkers in the Muslim world are very different from liberal thinkers in the Western world, but we would call your family liberal thinkers um, in the Muslim world, obviously, but the society at large around you, that's where the restrictions were. Is that is that a fair statement to make? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's really good because. A lot of times people say things like, oh, you know, the Quran, for example, says that men can beat their wives. So does that mean that every Muslim man is going to beat their wife? No, it doesn't. But it means the ones that want to beat their wives have divine sanction to beat their wives. You know what I mean? There's going to be good men, of course, and there's going to be bad men. But the bad men have this, you know definitive proof from their Allah that they're not doing anything wrong. And and that's the problem. And, and that's the problem in Pakistan and in Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan and all of these countries is when the, the law enforcement and the government is misogynist, is meant to control women. You know, look at Iran, for example, you know, then it doesn't matter how open minded you are as a family as individuals when you're going to be restricted by your government. And then, of course, the families like mine, I was the exact opposite situation of you. I was living in Canada, where it's obviously a free country, but my family was the one that was restricting me. So, you know, quite often women have both layers. You know, they have a restrictive family and a restrictive government. Um, and it you, it's like... <sighs> It's so difficult to find the, you know, a situation where there's a Muslim girl who can live a comfortable, happy, free life. You know, there's always going to be something in her way. Um, before we move on to your life um, in Pakistan a bit more, I want to talk, I want to just go back to Algeria because um, I know that during the 90s, that was a very dark time with Islamists kind of, um, swelling, you know, taking over, controlling, like actually killing women who are wearing, not wearing hijab or who are traveling without men. And um, there was a lot of Algerian refugees that came to Canada at that time. They're fleeing all over the world um, to get away from the Islamists there. Did you see any of that when you were there or was that before? 
I did see a lot of, uh, you know, radical, radic you know, they're very uh, crude. They're very raw. They're not, they're not highly educated. But at that time, when, as far as I can remember, because I was very young, um, I can remember the girls were uh, pretty uh, dressing up like, you know, the girls in Turkey dress up, like they would wear tank tops, you know, skirts, Muslim girls. So it wasn't as uh, bad as purple. I, I, I think we got out of it before all the radicalization. I know now it's not, if I go there, I wouldn't recognize it's the same country because there is radicalization all over the Islamic world. You're now. absolutely correct. You're absolutely, it did. It started like around when this Islamic revolution in Iran, and then it just spread like a virus throughout the Middle East and North Africa. And now it's, of course, continuing to spread into the West right now, too. So that's really sad. Of course, I can't, I mean, I, I, Pakistan probably never had a day when it was, <laughs> when yeah. it was open-minded and liberal or secular yeah. or anything like that, because it was mm -hmm. the entire reason for its existence was, you know, um, yeah. yeah, exactly. It was, for, it was Sharia and Islamization and that whole separatist uh, attitude. So Pakistan Did is one of the worst. The Islamic words, you know, the wife beating. I yeah. don't even... I don't even think my father knew about this verse existed. He was very liberal. He was very, you know, secular. He never said anything to us like pray, do this, don't do that. Never. Not even my mother because they were both educated. They went to a desire to teach because they were teaching college students. Uh, uh, English was a, uh, it was an elective subject. So they were teaching English and maths. So they were educated. So they never, but I remember, I know a family member who used to be um, like not my family member, but my one of my, you know, close family member was married to the person used to beat her with the Quran. Oh, this allows me to beat you. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, this wow. gives me the right to beat you. So that person knew his right to beat her with the Quran. And uh, but my father, he probably doesn't even know this verse exists in Quran. So this is how different men are in the Muslim world. There would be some men who's like, no, you're supposed to love your wife. This this verse doesn't mean like that. But there are men who know that this verse exists and they have the right to beat. And, you know, I have to say that when you teach young boys these things, it puts the ideas in their minds. So it's like when you were saying, even as a young girl, if you're playing outside, riding a bike, they're going to look at you like, oh, she's a she's a whore. You know, even mm -hmm. though you're like a literal child, but that's the judgment that they're going to make about you because you're not wearing hijab, because you're playing outside, because you're riding a bike. You know what I mean? It's these social ideas that we 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 create the misogyny in these boys. And when you take those young boys and you teach them these verses in the Quran, when you tell them your wife is basically like less than a dog, and if she is disobedient then you hit her i mean we don't even hit our own animals but no you hit your wife if she disobeys then we're putting those ideas in those boys heads we're raising them to be the kind of men that you just described that is going to grow up to beat his wife and the fact that your father never learned these verses means that he would have just naturally been a normal good human being that would never think to hit his wife you know what i mean but if he grew up in an environment that taught him, oh, no, this is what you do. This is how you control your wife. Then he would think, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do as a man, you know? Yeah. And I don't know how it is in Pakistan, but in Arab societies, if a man doesn't control his wife, then he's constantly berated by the rest of the society. They're always telling him, oh, you're so weak. Oh, you can't control your wife. You know, like he's the one who's going to be attacked for not being a misogynist asshole you know in pakistan it's the same thing they there is a word for it it's called zan murid zan means women like you know zan is a mean and the murid means uh slave so they they call the men who are slave to their wives the men who are just being decent human beings treating their wives with respect and you know equality they're called they're labeled as this so my father would be labeled as one because the way he was, he would be called that. But, you know, I don't think he cared. 
but there are guys who really like care about it so they want to like appear tough in front of their own family they would be nice to their wives when they're alone but when they're with the family they would try to demean her or disrespect her and i have seen that happening as well just to tell their family oh i i am controlling my wife she she she's under me she's under my thumb so this is actually happening in pakistan too yeah there was there's a subset of arab culture sometimes where on the wedding day they hit their wife in front of all of the guests they slap her in the face to show from the beginning that i am the man and i am going to control her and you see these videos all over youtube people are sharing them on twitter and whatnot and they think oh it's just this horrible man how could he hit his wife on their wedding day and i'm like it's not just one horrible man that's the society that's what they encourage you know they 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 want to see that and you know what happens after he slaps her everybody claps everybody and the, claps and the bride clapped too <laughs> no no she's not clapping but she's expecting it she knows okay. it this is what has to happen publicly he's going to demean you because now you are his wow and this is your new place in life yeah so tell me about moving to America, because that must have been, you know, after living in Algeria and living in Pakistan, I'm sure going to America must have been like breathing oxygen for the first time as a woman. Yeah, it was basically what happened was my my life story is kind of uh, not as straightforward. I, I, I got married and then I moved here. Um, so like things took a very strange turn my you know there was there was a problem my ex was not you know what his education he lied about his education so there was like whole different scenarios so i had to struggle uh, in the beginning in america i had to start from scratch i you know worked in gas stations like collected money and i had a son so along with oh him God. i was working i was studying for my exams usmle uh, and then I was like raising my son as well. So I used to like, you know, go to work, come back home, take him in my, you know, lap and study for five, six hours while he's in my lap. So I, and then, you know, sleep for a few hours and go back to work. So I was like working around the clock. I did like do two jobs at one point just to collect money and, you know, survive. And then I kind of, oh, uh, you know, you can call me like an American dream, somebody, you know, work from scratch way up and then achieved. So it was kind of a rocky start in America. It was a cultural shock as well. It was not like I was, you know, <laughs> I was lying in bed of roses here. Yeah. And I was not telling my family back home as well. I didn't want to make them, uh, you know, worried about me. So I was telling them everything is good and I'm like thriving here and <laughs> all that, but I was struggling. So in first few weeks, uh, years in America, first four or five years, I was like really struggling very bad. But I, you know, got my residency and things, you know, got better from that time. So yeah, you did it. You made it. So the studying that you were doing, that was because you were already a physician, right? This was just yeah. sort of, I guess, to transfer to get like to to make yeah. American you have to take uh, step one USML United States medical license exam step two step three then you have to go for residency match you have to interview you have to apply for programs and you have to go to every state where you're uh, you get the interviews so you have to travel it's a lot of expense mm -hmm. and then you have to wait for it's like a year-long process it's not easy and then you interview these places and you wait for the match. It happens four or five years, four or five months later, they announce it online and then uh, people find out if they got the residency or not. So it's a long process. Wow. Well, good for you. That that's amazing. I'm 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 honored and proud. You know, I'm I'm really grateful that you came to share your story with us today because I think that's probably the most important part of your story right there that you just told us that resilience, because it, even if, you know, I'm obviously there's a lot of culture shock. There's a, it's always difficult moving from one country to another. Um, but, you know, you, you had to overcome so many more obstacles than the average person. 
but you did it. You see, that's the that's the common thread between a lot of the people that I have on this podcast is we have the most insurmountable odds in front of us. And it looks like we're never going to be able to make it through, but we just keep pushing. And that's why I love to have conversations with women like you, because I know there's so many other people out there that are watching these episodes. And I know because they're sending me messages all the time feeling like they are in that position that you were in when you first arrived, going through a divorce, a single mom, having to work at a gas station, having to, you know, Americanize your your medical license, all of those things that you had to go through. Um, but you you kept pushing and, and you did it. And, and that's an inspiration to so many people out there. So how did your family react to the divorce? Like, was your family pretty cool about that? Were they like sort of normal or did they go and be, you know, Muslim about it? <laughs> so my father had passed away when I, you know, did divorce. So he didn't, he didn't know, uh, but he knew that I wasn't uh, happy <laughs> at that time. Uh, my mother was the one actually who was pushing me to divorce because he wow. figured that he was not the right person because when she she came to America, she lived with me for a few months and then she realized that I actually didn't realize my mother made me realize because oh. I was so busy working and everything. I didn't know what, you know, his antics were. So he, she said that your future, I don't, your future is dark if you stay with him. So she's the one who pushed me. I give her the credit. And, uh, you know, then she opened my eyes and then you, I saw it for myself as well. Uh, so um, my family is pretty supportive. Everybody's, you know, yeah, they were like, you know, maybe they were not because they were not with me. I was not living with them. So they didn't know the whole situation, what was going on. But they had confidence in me that I would take the right steps. I'm, you know, so... They were okay with me. That's wonderful. That's that's one in a one in a million story. Yeah. That you just told. That's that's fantastic that you have two wonderful parents. So that's really great. Um, now, what about when you decided to leave Islam? What, were they? Yeah. So, just as so the Islam is connected to my divorce. <laughs> so I was going through divorce. And mm -hmm. uh, by that time, I had two kids, like I have a daughter as well. So um, and then I, you know, divorce is not an easy thing, no matter how bad your marriage was when you get go for divorce, even though I filed it, I was still under a lot of distress. It's like a soul crushing experience. If somebody had gone through, they would know. And especially when you're alone, you have no family. So I thought I'll connect with God. I started reading Quran and uh, I decided to read it in Urdu. I said, I'll just learn it with understanding. I would just connect with God. So I started, you know, listening to the translation in Urdu. And uh, so, uh, so, you know, I was so, um, uh, I was in pain and I thought I'll get some words of, you know, uh, comfort from God. But instead, every you know, you keep reading Quran and God seems like a very angry guy who's like just wants to throw you in hell. And he just like hates Jews and Christians and he just wants to uh, and he's like threatening constantly throughout the Quran. Like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Your skin will come off and I'll give you new skin and that will burn and you will burn until eternity. Then the good people will be in heaven. Like this message is on repeat. And then God starts praising himself for for no reason. <laughs> then some story starts like randomly from in the middle. That story doesn't end, but next story starts. The next topic starts like keeps jumping from one topic to another. And I was like, I was like listening. to. I was like, where am I in this? Like, when is God going to tell me I got you? I am like, <laughs> I'm going to take care of you. Your love. Like nowhere. I was like, I kept on going until 13 chapters and you know my heart was already in so much uh, you know distress it was so heavy on my heart the message I couldn't take it I was like why God is threatening me I'm gonna go to hell what did I do I'm already in distress like I thought he was telling me that he's gonna throw me in hell because you know when you read Quran and it's like talking to you right who yeah. else is it talking about 
and then i uh, you know it was like uh, i stopped reading after 13 i was like i can't take it anymore there is nothing new in it like it's the same thing over and over again so at that time my, one of my friend was uh, she was doing her phd from pakistan so she came to america and she confided in me because i'm like you know i'm very rational tolerant person like like people open up to me very easily so she said she's an atheist and at that time i i felt very bad for her like oh may allah guide her in the right direction i felt so bad i was like oh so she's she's going to go to hell so maybe i should help change her mind so i she gave me some arguments you know there are some scientific inaccuracies in quran i didn't know that much about quran so i was like i went and uh, started uh, you know like to counter her arguments to as so i started listening to zakir naik's videos you know why heard of her so so i would go back to her to counter her like tell her the she i said you know there is entropy mentioned in quran right so she she told me about other um, scientific inaccuracies so i would go back like listen to videos to give her the arguments back and forth we kept on going and then you know i rejected all the zakir naik so i was like no he's not you know as uh, educated so i started listening to ghamidi he's another uh, scholar i don't know if you know about him so he's very javed ahmed ghamidi he's kind of a, you know modern kind of scholar like if you say liberal version of islam he's mm. uh, not a typical mullah so he would even say like you know women don't have to wear hijab you're only supposed to be hijab of your eyes or your soul or something like that some mystical yeah. version of quran that's not true but yeah. he trying to you know do some make up of the islam to make it palatable or digestible so so a lot of modern like muslims or moderate muslims would try to adopt his kind of version of quran but it has nothing to do with the real quran right so i started mm-hmm. listening to him so i really wanted to know what he has to say about the existence of god he had this 50 minute video long video about uh, the somebody asked him question does god exist and he he speaks in very you know like uh, authentic urdu where he uses very difficult words and uh, it's all basically you know wording how he words you know the sentences like makes them beautiful like literally like poems but in there's no substance in it yeah so he, he went on for 50 minutes but he didn't answer the question i was like maybe i didn't i missed the point when he answered does god exist or not so i listened to it again and and i was like there was nothing he so i said okay so god doesn't exist there is no proof that god exists after that it kind of opened my eyes and then i went back to quran reading like you know the the you know the curtain has lifted about the you know all that the uh, you rever- reverberation or whatever you call it so i started reading quran again with critical eye so now you could like when you read quran uh, not with the devotion you read it as a critic you can spot so many mistakes and that's what happened like i spotted so many mistakes like the aisha's story where her necklace is lost and uh god sends a special verse to say that she's innocent so you know i was like why god is sending this verse like what are we supposed to do with it now after mm-hmm. 1400 years later it's a useless verse for us what are we supposed to learn from this incident like what is this and then there were like meaningless verses so many yeah so, like the verse my favorite is the verse that where allah says after you're finished having dinner at the prophet of allah's house please leave Please. promptly <laughs> yeah don't hang yeah, out yeah it was like <laughs> guidelines so there yeah. there was another verse where god says that all muslim men can marry their adopted sons wives mm-hmm. so that was very specific i was like no mm-hmm. muslim men that i know have ever married their grand like not their daughter in law like mm-hmm. even in like not muslim households it's frowned upon so this verse only served purpose to one man exactly so that means it was written by him mm-hmm. it's like literally common sense i don't know why we will support like like go mm-hmm. around and around trying to make it something that it's not uh, like and aisha aisha said that in one hadith she says oh i find it curious that you know your god always 
tends to say things that perfectly align with what you want. Yeah, she probably figured it out. And they just mm-hmm. removed all this from the literature because mm-hmm. she had fought so many, uh, you know, wars. She must know something that mm-hmm. this is not real. And she knows him, right? She's yeah. been with him literally her whole life. She yeah. grew up with Ten him. Years. Yeah. Ten years. Ten years. Yeah. But I mean, she was a child. So yeah. she got to see him. You know what I mean? Like she got to know him intimately, I think, more than his persona that he's presenting to the rest of the world that doesn't really work on children children don't care about personas and your your Mm. what your name is or what your status is they don't care and so she's just seeing him as a normal person and so I think she could she could see through him but people today still can't but Madiha I love the uh I love the description of the Quran because that is exactly how it is it's, people always say like, oh, it's so poetic. If you don't understand it, it's because it's like the best poetry that was ever written. I'm like, no, it's really badly edited. <laughs> like, it's so repetitive. And like you said, he starts a story and then he ends it. And then there's like random things in there that don't make any sense. What are they connected to? There's so many words in there even that we we still don't know what the meaning is. And they'll, they'll tell you things like, oh, Allahu alam. Only Allah knows. Such, such divine. Why meaning. is he writing? <laughs> Why is he writing that? Yeah, yeah. And and I think a lot of people, myself included, became non-believers in this religion once we started to look at the Quran with a critical eye. That's all it takes. All it takes mm-hmm. is to read that one book. You forget the hadith. The hadith are so easy. Anybody reading, if anybody bothered to read through the hadith, there's just so many of them. It's just, and most people don't bother. Um, but it's so easy. If you start reading the hadith immediately, you're going to realize, okay, this is this is a, a just a, a mess. You know, this is just absolute nonsense. But most people don't crack open those, you know, just so many volumes of a hadith. But if you're going to pick up the Quran and start reading it, read it translated in your language. Like you said, before you get to the end of the book, you're going to realize this whole thing is just absolute nonsense. Actually, the interesting thing is I left Islam even before finding out the wife beating Hadith, before finding out the sex slaves, like all these things just kind of confirm that I was right. But I left Islam just by reading 13 chapters on my own and uh, these meaningless verses that served only prophet's purpose there was another verse the third so there were three verses that were my deal breaker i was like this guy was writing verses for himself there was there's a verse that if you call your wife your sister or your mother you're like your back is just like your mother or your your my or my mother then your marriage is broken you you're supposed to freeze this many slaves or you know, you are slaughtered this many camels or do fast for this many days. And I was like, what's the big deal? Just apologize. <laughs> Why do you have to? Th-? And then, you know, it's like, we don't have slaves anymore. So this uh, solution of God is expired. So mm-hmm. I was like, what is-? so that t- tells you the message is not timeless. This, the, mm-hmm. this message is expired. Yeah. So these were my, you know, my objections. So I did not even know about ex-Muslim movement. I did not know anybody else left Islam. I knew only knew about my friend who was an atheist at that. So I was, I literally, I was in a vacuum and I left it. I was like, no, it's not for me. Yeah. Um, have you read Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses? I haven't read it, uh, but I've read like Christopher Hitchens, The God is Not Great. I yeah. read Richard Dawkins. Um, yeah. No, it is because what you just described there. So the first the first person to be killed for apostasy was actually Muhammad's scribe. So, you know, he was illiterate. Right. So when he got something from he got a message from Allah, Gabriel told him, you know, through the ancient uh, telephone, he would tell his scribe, write this down. And that scribe was the first person to realize that Muhammad was just full of BS. And so he's the first person to say, I, I don't believe in you anymore, and I don't believe in your Allah, and he was killed. 
And in the Satanic verses, there's a, a there's also a character like that who realizes, you know, that these verses that Muhammad is telling me, first of all, they coincide perfectly with what he wants to do when he wants to do it. And also he forgets sometimes, like he has it written down, the scribe has it written down so he knows. And so he'll ask Muhammad, like, you know, this verse that you just talked about now contradicts the one that you said before, you know, how is Allah confused? <laughs> you yeah. know, but Allah's not confused. It's Muhammad that's confused, you know? Um, and so it's the same sort of thing. Like once you start reading it and you, and you can see through it right away that this is the work of a, of a man um, and a not so intelligent man at that. So how did your family react to you deciding that you didn't want to be a Muslim anymore? So my family is open-minded. So uh, as I told you, my mother, of course, she felt really bad, but then I think she forgot. Uh, my 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 brothers and my sister told not, not to tell her, not to argue with her because, you know, she, she would feel bad, then she will be sad for you and she would want, she would pray to God for you to come back. You know, there is no point to make your parents sad at this age. Mm -hmm. uh, they have lived all their lives with this religion. They're not going to leave at this point. It's, it, you know, they're they're not rational because the, the way they were raised. So yeah. the God yeah. is basically in their DNA now. So, yeah. Yeah. but my, my other fam uh, brothers and my sister, they're pretty cool with it. <laughs> That's one. My God, you you come from like the perfect little family that all of us wish we could have come from. <laughs> That's wonderful, Madiha. Um, so tell us about your life now. So now you are remarried. Yeah. Yeah. So congratulations on finding you. good, a good man that your mom would approve of. Um, and your life as a physician has now, you know, now it's more comfortable. You're obviously not suffering as you did when you first came and everything has kind of mellowed out. Did you imagine this for yourself when you were a kid growing up in Pakistan? Did you ever think, oh, I'm going to be living in America as a physician, married with two kids? Yeah. The dream Never. come true. I mean, I was not, uh, I was a very like, you know, tomboy. Never thought about my future. I never even thought about getting married. I was like, you know, my my sister was like very much fascinated by bridal, bridal clothes and all that. Like, even when I got married, I wore her bridal dress. I was like that least bothered. I was like, you know, you have that dress. I'm just going to wear that. So I was never into these things. So, but, you know, I think uh, the way my life turned out, how I struggled and uh, like literally at one point I was like rock bottom. I was, you know, I, I tell everybody because, you know, people... When they see you, you're like comfortable in your life. They don't realize how much hardships you have come over. There was yeah. a time in my life that I didn't have money for gas for my car. There was a time in my life that I used to sit in uh, Barnes & Noble and Starbucks to study. Because, you know, exams, uh, medicine exams are hard. You have to study eight hours straight sitting on in chair. So I used to have one cup of coffee and then I would save that cup come next day to get a refill 50 cents then I would you know change use the same cup so I got I used to sit in that Starbucks you know every all employees knew me so they would just give me a new cup because as a courtesy mm -hmm. just for the 50 cents so I, I just tell people like you know don't lose hope if you're you know at the bottom just keep your eyes up, like, you know, have a goal, have a target. So I think at, I have seen so much, you know, going through divorce in America alone. I've like gone through the courts and all that, lawyers and whatnot. So I I have seen life so close. It makes me, uh, I think I've, I've always been very vocal about issues too. So I I find it like I just think like educating other people and getting them out of this cult. I feel like it's my passion to speak up and speak up against any injustice, especially for women inequality. You know, I, I sometimes think to myself like, you know, I'm comfortable in my life. What's my problem? <laughs> Why can't I just like enjoy what I have like, but this I enjoy doing this. So it, I, yeah. 
and it and you get to give back. It's so rewarding. And it it's like all of this darkness in your past that you're talking about, all of these negative experiences, if you're able to turn them into something positive now, which is to share your experience with others, to inspire them to keep going, like you said, then it sort of feels like all of that stuff was like, it was not for nothing. You know what I mean? Because now you're going to help other people. And I, I totally feel the same way as you. I've actually had ex-Muslim women tell me, like, why are you doing this? Why are you putting yourself in danger? Why are you putting your family in danger? Why don't you just, like, you know, you have a great husband, you have a great kids, you have a great home, just live your life quietly and, and appreciate your life. And it's because I feel like that would be so incredibly selfish, you know? I don't know if you feel this too, but I have such a sense of survivor's guilt as well. I can, I'm reading the papers, I'm reading Twitter, I'm seeing what the women are going through throughout the world. I know what they're going through because I felt that, you know, even as far as, as, as Shani Luke on October 7th, seeing her body on that truck, you know what I mean? That's going to hit any one of us that has been a victim of this Islamic misogyny, this literal hate for women that they have. We're all going to feel that. We're all going to feel that immediately. And what kind of person would I be if I'm at the point in my life where I'm privileged to be able to speak that I don't use my voice? You know, you lived in Pakistan. You know that there's millions of girls, millions of women who can't speak. They can't open their mouth. And some of them don't even know. Some of them don't even know that the, the the horrible circumstances that they're living in because it's so normalized and so for you to use your voice to spread light and to spread you know hope my god that's like the that's the that's the best possible use of your life you know yeah yeah and so that's why you have this youtube channel Mediha talks right so tell right. me Tell me a little bit about that channel and, and people that have contacted you and, and just your experience with that channel. So I'll, I'll tell you why I started the channel. So I was uh, in my class WhatsApp group of my med school and I used to be very vocal about a lot of things, you know, and I but you would be surprised how brainwashed people are in Pakistan and uh, no, how radical they are. Uh, yeah, you're not surprised. <laughs> so in my entire class group of like, suppose there are 90 doctors and they're not like just in Pakistan, they're spread all across the world. There are somebody sitting in Dubai, somebody's in Australia, somebody in Canada, some a lot of people in USA. I was only feminist. So mm -hmm. the feminist, the feminism movement started, you know, with the Me Too in 2017, they started Women's March called Aurat March. Aurat means women. Yes. It started mm -hmm. in Pakistan and there was so much uproar in it. Like uh, the, the the women were carrying slogans, like, you know, just the placards. And one of the placards says, um, Apna khana khud garam kar lo. Like heat your own, heat up your own food, your own meal. Mm -hmm. That's all it said. It went, like the whole Pakistan went into frenzy. Like, what are they saying? Oh my God, what, like, this is like... This is with only this placard, the Pakistani, it just smashed the whole Pakistani. They, they were like shattered. And then, and then, so the, I was only feminist in my entire class. They were like all talking literally shit about women's marches on these women's are loose characters and they don't want to stay in the house. And Islam has given all the rights in Surah Nisa and blah, blah, blah. Then there was a, so there was a, you know, their, one of their slogan was my body, my choice, Mera Jassam, Meri Marzi. And everybody was like, oh, this is so sexualized. They, what do they want to be whores? They want just sexual freedom. What's wrong with that? But, you know, in Pakistani society, women cannot talk about any kind of freedom. So it, it made me so upset. So I used to write like long, you know, things. The, at the same time in India, there was a girl in Indian government, there were some Muslim issues going on. Indian government didn't want girls to wear hijab, like cover their face when they go to school. And there was this girl who stood up against all the goons and said, I want to wear hijab, I'm going to cover my face. And 
everybody in Pakistan was cheering to that girl. And I was like, literally what that girl is saying, my body, my choice. So mm-hmm. it's okay if she wants to hear it when she says it, but it's not okay when other women in Pakistan want to say, want, they're saying the same thing. They're saying my body, my choice. So that girl, you're cheering on to that girl because she wants to cover herself and you know, your patriarchy is stabilized with her decision, but you're not okay. So these things made me so upset. So they kicked me out of the group because I used to challenge, you know, I said, you know, Islam sexualizes women uh, because the concept of virgins in heaven is sexualizing women. And I just wrote that and they was like, oh my God, what is she writing? And she's a feminist and she's this. Her uh, ideas don't, doesn't, don't align with our ideology. So I was kicked out of the group. So I got so pissed. <laughs> I was like, just, if you don't let me speak. This, this group yeah. was, Amer- was Pakistani doctors? Doctors. They're like, it's not like they were not exposed to the uh, secular or liberal world. These people live in America, in West, but they still harbor this dissent and hatred for the Western culture. They don't. They still. Um, they have superiority complex that their culture, Islam, is the it's gonna rule all over the world one time, one day, and then everybody's gonna be Muslim and this and that. I mean, it's like so they kicked me out, and then I was like, okay, I. I am so used to speaking up. I'm not gonna, nobody can stop me from speaking up. So then I did this interview with Harith Sultan when I left Islam. So I got in touch with him on Instagram. I saw his post. Somebody told me about Harith. Oh, he's an ex-Muslim. You should watch his videos. Then I contacted Harith. I sent him one of my write-ups and he said, oh, I should interview you. Then I did interview and I was like, I told him I'm very vocal. I, I, I wanna, he said, why don't you start your channel? So that's when I started my channel. So there was like this whole background behind this uh, mm-hmm. about women's issues and speaking up against injustice and this typical mindset. And since you've started your channel, how have you, um, how has it changed you? Like, has it made, has it, have you felt a sense of relief, a sense of reward? Have you been contacted by girls, other Pakistani girls and women? For example, I have been contacted by a lot of people, very few Pakistani girls. I don't know if women are scared or it's very difficult to change Pakistani women's mindset. For some reason, they're so happy in their bubbles. Like right now, the women I come across, they're very privileged women. You know, they're like, because, you know, the circle you move in, it's all physicians and they're all well settled in America. Uh, they're like, you know, they're happy with their parties and handbags and designers and this and that. So they live in their bubbles. They don't care. Um, the rest of the Pakistani girls in Pakistan, they're probably so Islamified. They're not going li- to tune into my channel, which is an ex-Muslim or atheist channel. So it, I have not been able to penetrate through, you know, that group of women. Uh, because women are not open-minded to even listen to any opinion other than Islamic. So you mentioned the feminists that started the Aurat March. What about those women? How much power do they have in the country? Are they just being attacked every time they try to open their mouth? Is there yes. Mm. Each time they do this Aurat March, especially when Imran Khan came, He made it so much worse because he's a mullah from inside. He just doesn't show his beard outside. Uh, He let these mullahs attack women. They were literally attacked and uh, uh, he didn't uh, help them at all. He just actually, he said women would wear uh, clothes, revealing clothes. They actually incite men. Men are not robots. One of his uh, stupid statement was that. So he's a... He's a typical misogynist. He's a playboy. Yeah. He's never going to be uh, respecting women. He's uh, so. Yeah, I remember that. I remember one of his his statements, too, that he made where he, he talked about even rape. And he that they, yeah. people were talking about the, the the numbers of people being raped in Pakistan are just astronomical. It's like every two hours somebody is sexually assaulted or something. And he he complained. He said, "Yeah, it's because the 
these women don't observe purga. They don't cover themselves. They're not wearing hijab. And so that's why they're getting raped. So that's Imran Khan in a nutshell. All right. Well, you have quite a few messages here in the chat. I apologize. I haven't been able to read them all because some of them are really, really long. But I'm going to open it up to the group. And then hopefully the people that are writing these chats um, will just turn on their cameras or at least their microphones and then ask you the question. Ah, Ira, you're the first person on my list here. You've got a very long essay there. Can you <laughs> unmute yourself and you can read it if you like, or maybe just summarize it for um, for Madiha up to you. No, no. I think if Medea wants to read it in the answer after this session, that's oh. fine. It's, okay. you know, it's not directly in what we're doing, but the excuse given for Pakistan is that it's really the entire Indian subcontinent that's this way. Al Jazeera uses that argument all the time uh, and produces loads of programs about how terrible India is toward women. Absolutely true. Uh, but that's the obvious purpose of the programs, and they say as much sometimes. So, of course, I wonder how can we distinguish the Islamic component of this problem from the Indian subcontinent component? And Islam ruled the, most of the Indian subcontinent for a fairly long time. Did it make things worse or did it actually make things better compared to the way Hinduism had done it? So that's what I'm wondering, but I don't know that that's what you've studied and you know, you may or may not want to answer that. I'm also wondering what the heck is going on between Pakistan and Iran and yeah. if you have any thoughts on that. Um, so I'm not sure why uh, the Indian, I think Indian subcontinent people were conservative to begin with, because what I see is in Hindu mythology, women were treated, you know, as subservient to men as well. If you see their Ram and Sita story, I think I, I probably not uh, saying the name right. He made her take the Agni Pariksha, like he made her because one of the Ravan was the villain who took Sita from Ram, took his wife from him. And when she came back, he wouldn't accept her until she walked on the, uh, you know, fire barefoot. So that's called Agni Pariksha. And she had to pass that test to show her modesty or like that she was still untouched by the Ravan. And that story is part of their mythology. So I would assume women have the same status in Hindu, uh, Hinduism uh, as like in Islam. So I think the area was conservative to begin with. I'm not sure why the people of subcontinent are worse than the rest of the world. Uh, but now the rest of the world is catching up, I think. I think Turkey was the only country which was like liberal, secular women were wearing whatever they wanted to wear, bikinis and all that. Now they are also in under Erdogan, that's changing very rapidly. So that's your first question. The second, the Iran, what's happening in Iran? I think, I don't know, Iran is trying to divert attention from the what's happening in Palestine. I'm, I'm, I really have no clue. I'm like, Pakistan army is not the, you know, innocent either. <laughs> They have done their fair share, so I'm not sure what's going on there. I, I would like to add to that, if I could, that obviously Christianity is full of a lot of misogyny as well. Um, so is Judaism. I think probably every religion we're going to find it because these religions were made in times when that was acceptable and that's the way the world was, you know. Like you mentioned slavery before, Medea, like that's that was just the norm back then. Um, there was no such thing as feminism, no such thing as equality. So that uh, makes sense. But what makes Islam particularly insidious is Sharia, is Islamic law. And that's what you have. That's what you have in Pakistan. So th this misogyny is codified into the law and is controlled by law enforcement. And so that encourages it to continue. You know, normally cultures can progress. But if you are forcing everybody to follow a 1400 year old book through, you know, threat of imprisonment, then you are going to stunt 
the the natural growth of, of your society. Right. There are some questions for me. Uh, yeah. One is from Alia, and I agree with her that uh, in Iran, women still stood up for themselves. In Pakistan, women, uh, the feminist, uh, the the women who come for the Aurat March, the women march, they don't see Islam as a problem. And uh, so this is what happened in Pakistan. You you're not they can't be open about Islam. They can't criticize Islam. But a lot of them, like I would say, ninety five percent of them don't see Islam as a problem. They see they think Islam has given them rights. Men are not giving them the rights that Islam has given them. So this is how they think. So I just feel like they're going in circles until and unless you challenge Islam. You cannot come out of your miserable situation that you are in because Islam has institutionalized patriarchy. It is you, 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 you know, it's like women defending Islam is like chicken defending KFC. It's the same thing. So you cannot be a feminist and a Muslim at the mm -hmm. same time. So I agree with Alia. And I think what happens is in Pakistan, women are in their bubble that uh, they're still waiting for Sharia laws and like you, wow. you go, go on the street and ask like a common person, uh, do you want, what do you think Pakistan should do? They would say, oh, Pakistan, if Pakistan had Sharia laws, all problems will be solved. In Iran, women have seen the curse of Islam firsthand. They have lived through it. They have, their whole lives were like in prison. Pakistani women are privileged enough not to have this forced and forced hijab and moral policing and their restriction to go wherever they want. So the Iranian women have stood up because they have lived through that horror. Pakistani women have not. They're still waiting. I was like, if you were waiting that much, maybe you deserve it. You know, it's like they don't realize that it's bad for you. Have you not seen what happened in Saudi Arabia? So many people in Saudi Arabia left us like leaving Islam, like Middle East the worst because they have seen Sharia laws firsthand. Same is gonna happen in Afghanistan. Women are going to leave. They're going to hate Islam, like a religion that literally treats them as a subhuman. Nobody would want it for their children either. I was on a Twitter space. There was a woman from Afghanistan. Somehow she got into Twitter and she was crying. She said, can somebody please take my daughters out of this country? At least I cannot get out, but anybody can adopt them. Like I was like literally a, felt so helpless for that woman. Um, speaking of women in Iran, Sarah is the next person um, who has a question for you. Hi. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Good. Thank you for speaking up. Thank you for sharing your story. Yasmin's podcasts are amazing because every time I feel like I'm the only one in, in this whole planet, I'm going to die alone and nobody's ever going to understand what I'm talking about. She has somebody and I have the privilege to be here. And it's the same thing again. And, and she always talks about Iran. And that's something I always have to acknowledge and thank her. I appreciate it because a lot of times when people talk about Islam and Muslims, Iran is just left out because we are Shia and they don't want to talk about us and we are not Arabs. So thank you, Yasmin. And thank you, Mediha. Now, a couple of things I want to talk about and I have a question. In Iran, we've been struggling. We've lost a lot of lives. The one reason they are attacking Pakistan is because they are losing the plot. They need that crisis outside the country in order to calm down the country and control people. And that might be the reason why they are doing this to Pakistan. And of course, Pakistan is not having it because they have the power. Uh, the other thing is that you said you were a feminist. And I'm, I want to argue that you were an atheist before you even realized that you were an atheist because feminism is blasphemous in Islam. Like there are so many verses in my favorite surah when you are half a man and you are inherit half and your husband can have four wives and as many slaves as they, he wants and you are not allowed to do that. Or he can beat you up if you're rebellious and they never discuss what rebellion means. So even the idea of being a feminist in Iran, it could lead to your execution because blasphemy leads to execution. And I have... I want to go back to what you started to talk about, because this for me right now is very important. And that's the idea of hijab and covering up. And you mentioned this, that you were catcalled and harassed. And 
how we all share that. Like, I don't know any Muslim or ex-Muslim woman, especially coming from Iran, who has at one point not been groped or harassed or catcalled or assaulted or raped. Like it goes up. I was assaulted first time I was assaulted on a bus. I was 11 years old. And I didn't know that it was an assault. I was watching sex education a couple of years ago. And there are just these teenagers talking about how one of them was assaulted. I'm sitting there thinking, that's, that's why I'm suffering from PTSD. That's why my life is the, like this anxiety that I have right now. And I was watching a video on Twitter a couple of days ago about these two white women. One of them is in niqab, one of them is in complete hijab, and they're talking about victims of grooming gangs in the UK and how it's their fault because they were not modest and they were not covered up. And if they were covered up, they would be safe. And I'm sitting there thinking, slut shaming, victim blaming, like, uh, this This doesn't make any, how, how can you just, what is your problem with facts? Like, how is, the, I was completely covered up. Every single woman in Iran is always completely like we are fighting back. They are fighting back now. But when I was growing up, we didn't dare to. We were not allowed to show hair at all. So I want you please to explain or go back to this and talk about your experience when you were covering up or women in your country when they were covering up and how this is just a pandemic. It's an epidemic. It's, it's touching everyone, no matter how covered up or not covered up you are. Because there is this myth in the Western world right now, and white women are buying into it, that if you're covered up, you're safe. If you go to Islam, you're safe. Women in Islam have lots of rights. Sorry, now I'm rambling. So I'm just going to stop talking. And if you please just explain, elaborate about your experience when you were covering up and not covering up. I just feel like when you're covered up, you are actually um, admitting that you're inferior, you know? You're basically telling the men the public space belongs to you. I am just here because I am, uh, you know, in fear and I need to do something. You know, in Islam, in Pakistan, they say, oh, women are supposed to go out of the house only if they really, really, really need to go out, you know. And you're right. You said I was a uh, atheist even before I realized I was an atheist. Because what happened is when I was going through divorce, uh, I decided to, you know, go for Umrah, you know, I said, you know, I really need to, you know, feel some, you know, uh, comfort from God. So I really need to go to God's house. And I was told that I cannot go alone without a mehram. At that time, they said, oh, but if you can take your son, he's your mehram. My son was like <laughs> eight or nine years old. I was like, I am the one taking care of him. I am his care caretaker. I'm like feeding him. I'm going alone to work all by myself. And I'm like in America surviving alone with two kids. If and you don't have, have a to go to God. <laughs> what if I have to if I have to go and see God, I need a man to tag along. You are subservient forever to a man. You are subjugated I, in this. I decided I'm work. not gonna go. <laughs> Even though I needed God so bad, I was like, I'm not gonna go. I stood up on the principle. And I was a Muslim man. I just got so angry at this. It's like, I'm not going to go. That's it. I, I, I'm i just going to deal with it. So, yeah, I was a feminist. I always questioned why Muslim men marry four times. Why women have to cover. Don't we have eyes? Don't we have brains? We can like guys too. Like, you know, you temptation, right? You So I was like, so women are not tempted. Only men are tempted. Like, isn't that dehumanizing women? Like you think women are just basically statues and their 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 wishes or whatever their feelings don't matter, only men's feeling matter. And yeah, hijab doesn't make you secure. It actually exposes you, makes you more vulnerable. Because if a woman, if a girl is not covered and she's wearing a jeans, a guy would a man would be very scared of touching her because he would say, you know, I don't know if she's gonna slap me back, because she seems like very confident. So that's the situation. And um, even if women go for Hajj, they're covered from head to toe, they're groped. And you will the women will tell their stories how they were groped while performing Umrah or performing, you know, uh, when they circumambulate between, around the Kaaba. And so there are little children in the madrasas and seminaries in Pakistan who get raped. But like, so if... Uh, 
and these molestation and abuse has nothing to do with sexual attraction it has to do with the it's a power they're basically exerting their power they're exercising their power control and they take pleasure out of it so it has nothing to do with your sexual fantasies and desires uh, the men who grope you at a bus stop they're just telling you oh i have the power here mm-hmm. you are in my territory so i don't think it covers you it it uh, protects you i think it's indoctrination from a very young age just to re- like we have to cover up at the age of 7 to go to school in yeah. order to get out of the house we have to cover up it's mandatory i so- was uh, still muslim uh, when um, um, i i decided to you know brainwash my daughter into islam at that time i hadn't left islam so she was like 5 years old i started sending her to the uh, mosque right so the 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 mullani in the mosque the whatever scholar she so she would wear skirts right my daughter but i i would give her a small scarf but that wouldn't cover her hair like it was a fashionable scarf just i wanted my daughter to look cute so she would object why her legs are not covered imagine five year old girl and then she would object that her scarf is not proper scarf so she gave her this like i don't know that thing that covers the whole thing hijab and my daughter would hate it she was like five years old and i never you know put anything on her she dresses up like the way she was like a sassy little girl how girls are uh, so she would hate it and then whenever she would come back she would feel very depressed and sad mm-hmm. i stopped sending her i was like when when i saw that this mulani is trying to indoctrinate my slowly trying to tell her this she's supposed to wear hijab and her body should be covered this is how early the brainwashing of little girls start by the time they are 12 or 13 they feel like it is the necessity and they feel uncovered exposed to the world by the time they are 18 they think this is they cannot live without it and then they think it's my choice no it's not you were brainwashed into this from an early it's childhood PTSD. it is ptsd yeah. there are yeah. so many of us we experience this like i i talked about this on one of the the podcast with yasmin as well that when i have air or or a, the wind in my hair i feel like oh my god they're they're going to kill me that somebody's going to attack me i'm going to get arrested and they're oh no no you are you're safe you're okay and somebody else was talking about this on twitter and i'm like okay i'm not the only one then it makes sense no now. no i have the same psd ptsd when i was young like maybe 9 10 years old there was an aunt in our house she used to she was very islamic so no my parents didn't care about islam but she used to come and tell us so she told me whenever a woman uh, goes out in public with her hair exposed angels curse at her i have this ptsd even now when i go outside with because i don't look cover my head and i feel like somebody is there cursing at me this is this is how bad it is thank you thank you madhi i appreciate it and thank you yasmin thank you both tochi i don't know if i'm pronouncing your name correctly but you're next yes thanks hi um it is correct what's up yasmin um i love your videos by the way so oh um, thank you yeah, yeah, yeah. I, i i came at this a very different like i I'm a hip hop dude and there's a dude I know in Japan funny enough who was like yo check out this conversation it was like that you had I can't remember with some lady and I was like oh this is this is dope anyway um I wanted okay. to just tell a very brief story but um because you all were talking about the the head covering but um I have family in Texas so I was actually flying I was flying out of Austin to come back to Toronto and I'm talking to this lady from Memphis at the um at the counter you know the air canada counter whatever and so i uh, somehow she was like you know i'm really thinking about um you know converting to islam i i i love the um i love the hijab i love the idea of it i it makes me feel protected it feels like like men respect you more when you when you wear it <laughs> so i was like oh well, okay i mean to, to each his or her own But, Why is she having this conversation with an Air Canada employee? Like how well, random. It's it's very it was we were talking about you know we connected we were talking about where we you know life growing up or whatever. I I'm I'm not even sure how we came to the topic. Mm-hmm. But I told her I was like, oh, "Okay, well, you know, in, in my honest opinion, well, I used to like I I went to high school in Saudi. I used to live in Saudi Arabia." Mm-hmm. And she was like, "Where?" I was like, "I used to live in Saudi Arabia." She was like, "Where?" And I was like, 
you've you've never even heard of Saudi Arabia? Like she was like, no, I've never heard of it. And I was like, so I think it's fascinating that someone who is thinking about converting to Islam hasn't even heard of Saudi Arabia. What that tells me is that there's some kind of campaign going on somewhere. Um, people are spending real money to um, sort of, you know, spread Islamic ideas. That's what that tells me. But yeah. anyway, um, <laughs> but my, actually, my question for you, uh, Medea, was, um, you know, as, as a non-believer, do you feel that um, atheism can ever really sort of catch on as a majority worldview? Or do you think it will always be like just a bunch of us, like a minority folk, if that makes sense, you know? So what I think is that um, right now we are all like very uh, isolated, like we need to all join forces and educate educate the Western people as well. Like, you know, you, I see some of other, you know, I see Ida and Louis. I think we need to spread the word how toxic Islam is. Uh, until and unless some someone gave us platform like ex-Muslim from Pakistan because I'm banned I, I will be banned in Pakistan my channel might get blocked or something I'm like speaking up on Facebook but the more we gain like the more vocal we are the ex-Muslims that's why I am starting to do like all these interviews because people need to hear us and we need to gain like numbers. And when we gain numbers, then at least we will not have death threats because uh, uh, the more we are, like as we grow our numbers, they're gonna go on the, you know, because we're exposing Islam and they're, we're, we're telling once, when you leave Islam, you're killed. And they're gonna go on back foot like, no, no, Islam is a religion of peace. We don't kill, see, we, we let you talk. At least they're gonna go like slowly on their back foot. Uh, if we don't speak up, we get scared, we don't like expose Islam, they're gonna probably come and kill us. Like, oh, there are just few of them, just take care of them and nobody will, they learn their lesson, nobody will speak up. So I think uh, the more uh, Western news covers this, somebody should like tell CNN to cover ex-Muslims, that there is a movement going on. There are people who are leaving Islam their voices should be heard, their life is in danger just for exercising their freedom of speech. Um, somebody should gather all the ex-Muslims, there should be seminars or, you know, I, I think we need to be vocal about it that like the world needs to hear us. And I definitely think they're trying to Islamize the West, they're trying to take over, this is their dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I, I'm talking about all my class fellows who are like, in Western countries living their Islamic lifestyle. I was like, why would, why you guys didn't move to Saudi Arabia? Like you could live their Islamic lifestyle there. Why you live in the West, hate it for, hate the Western society, hate the Western culture, but still live here just to reap the benefits? Yeah, if you don't mind, I can I just follow up very briefly on that? Because um, um, I'm sorry. The first of all, what both of y'all, everyone here is doing is, is really important because I've been atheist for a very long time. Um, I, I think that was informed by living in Saudi. But the point is, um, I feel like atheism is looked at as a very, or humanism, whatever, is looked at as a very white thing. You know, I've, I've been through, you know, the Dawkins and David Silverman era and, you know, all those guys. So I, I know those guys. But the point is that, like, I do wonder, I'm always curious when I come across minorities, quote unquote, like us, um, who are non-believers, because it, it's almost, I mean, it is rare, and it's almost kind of like there's a perception gap where people just kind of assume that, you know, non-belief is a, is a Western thing, it's a white thing, um, it's not for us or whatever. And I'm and I do think that obviously more of us need to enter that space so that we can kind of be a, like a, an example or a lead or at least give people and say hey like it's not just a white thing um so I, I i guess what i'm trying to say is i do wonder if there's a way that from your perspective if like you would change the messaging a little bit you know um of of non-belief or something like that like is there something you would do differently um in terms of trying to explain non-belief that then you've seen you know bill maher or some of these other people do it I, that's just but that was kind of where i was going at that question 
So I I don't use the word ex-Muslim that often because I think it triggers uh, Muslims a lot because they they cannot imagine somebody's leaving their perfect religion because majority Muslim think their Islam is perfect and when you expose these things they they gaslight you oh you didn't understand you you should listen to you should consult a mullah and all that so I don't use the ex-Muslim just to trigger them or just to get under their skin. I use the word atheist, that literally means no religion, because there is no evidence of God. And that's how I try to explain them. Most of my videos touch upon the topics uh, from an atheist perspective. Uh, I do bring up Islamic hadith because they contradict what the current morality is. And that they're just trying to show them how it is so backward. Like there was a Islamic scholar, there's a famous Islamic scholar, in, uh, Muslim, Pakistani Islamic scholar called Molana Tariq Jamil. And his son committed suicide. And I made a video about it, how in Islam, if you commit suicide, you're supposed to go to hell. And so I just showed them that Islam, because the in the era Islam was invented, there was no concept of mental health. So if somebody committed a suicide, so you're, so he's supposed to go to hell. So how you, you know, how as a Muslim, how do you, uh, you know, rectify with all these things that are out there? So it doesn't make any sense. But then people say, oh, but if somebody committed suicide for, it's like anybody who will commit suicide will have some mental health issues. Nobody commits suicide for pleasure. So why are they burning in hell? So. These things I do bring up Islam and, you know, I don't know how you can soften the message without uh, discussing hardcore Islam. They're going to get, uh, uh, you know, irritated by whatever we say. Once you're turned into an atheist, they don't like the word. In, they call it mulhid and it's a very negative word or murtid. Yeah. Um, if I could respond to that too. Um... I want to say first and foremost, Tochi, you're absolutely correct. There is a lot of money behind the Islamization of the West. Of the, you know, that's what Hijab Day was all about. It was about encouraging non-Muslim women to start wearing hijab. A lot of petrodollars coming from Qatar. You know, there's Muslim student associations. There's a Muslim Brotherhood. There's Hizb Tahrir. There's it's a huge, very successful propaganda machine. Billions of dollars are going to Ivy League universities in the United States to push these messages. Um, so we are very much the underdogs pushing back against all of that. And also what you said about it, atheism being a predominantly white thing, you're correct. And if you look at the statistics just demographically, that is true. Because usually Western societies are a lot more individualistic than the, you know, Middle Eastern, North African, you know, predominantly Muslim, for example, societies. Um, and so when somebody decides that they don't want to be a Christian anymore, or they don't want to, you know, they want to leave the whatever, they don't want to be Jehovah's Witness anymore, then they can do that. There's nothing, there's no bounty on their head, there's nobody trying to kill them, you know what I mean? It, it could cost them friendships, maybe even family relationships, but it's because we're such an individualistic society in the West, you can still survive. It's not that big of a deal, you know, but you know what it's like in Saudi Arabia, incredibly tribal, right? Like that's probably one of the most tribal societies out there today. Um, so it, it, you can't just make a decision in a bubble, especially if you're a female, you're seen as like the point of the family honor is in you it's like between your legs actually and so whatever decision a, a woman makes just like affects the entire family so women are burdened with all of this guilt and stuff and so that's why a lot of them don't speak up and don't speak out um so you see it less in in our societies than you do in societies that kind of leave people alone to be individuals um and the other thing regarding your question about do I ever think, or you're asking Madiha, but I'm going to answer it anyway, um, if it's ever going to be mainstream for people to be non-believers. I think, unfortunately, at the end of the day, most people are followers and PCs, honestly. People just want a book where they can just follow. It's hard being an atheist. You know what I mean? There's no answers. I grew up in a world where all the answers were in one book, you know? 
And now suddenly when you decide that you don't want to believe in any of that anymore, there are no answers. Like everything is a mystery and it's, it's beautiful and it's exciting and, you know, the mystery and the mystique and all that, but it's also terrifying. It's really, really scary. Um, and so a lot of people, for a lot of people, that's a really difficult step to take. And I, I think back to my mom when she would like look at libraries and bookstores and she'd be like, look at all these non-believers reading all these books, trying to find the answers, wasting their time. Doesn't, don't they know that the answers are all in one book? You know, she, pr she found it comforting that she only ever needed to read one book like that is the most you know diminishing thing possible to tell a human like squish your brain down and just read this one book but for some people they find comfort in that and uh, uh, most people find comfort in that they 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 want to be the sheep they want to be the followers um and there's always going to be some shepherd out there that's nefarious, whether it's Muhammad or whether it's Jim Jones or whether it's, you know, the Scientology guy, I forgot his name right now, or any of these guys. Um, they're, they're always there, cult leaders, basically leading people into whatever it is that's going to serve them the best. And I don't know if we're ever going to grow past religion, because I think that we are not rational creatures. We're just not. And it's going to take... Um, it's going to take a while, I think, if if we ever do um, see that Islam is at the point where Christianity is right now. Like you can believe in your faith, in your mosques, in your homes, but for the love of everything, stay out of the public sphere, stay out of policy, stay out of government, stay out of law enforcement, like keep your religion to yourself, keep it in your pants, you know. Um, I'd love to just see that. If I could just see that, then I would be happy. But to say, you know, that one day people won't believe in, you know, mystical absurdities. No, I think that we're just we're always going to whether it's religion or whether it's something else, all sorts of different ideologies out there that are, you know, just as not just as um, but all sorts of ideologies out there that are also dangerous. Um yeah, I don't know. I don't think we'll ever evolve past that. I just feel like uh, religion should be like social security number. Just keep it to yourself. We don't need to know. It's like, why do we, you know, why are you announcing it? Yeah. Okay, Khaled, you're next. Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. Thank you, Madhya. Really, I appreciate it. And first of all, I just congratulate you that like you know i i myself as a ex pakistani i would say <laughs> so i understand all the things you have been through and i i i i really uh, being proud that some of uh, person from my country the women is coming up and speaking really it's 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 an honor for me anyway so so i have one comment really and and then i have a one question for you as well uh, like you know the comment i want to make is is about like uh, that Pakistan was not radicalized earlier. I I am uh, born in 60s, really. So I saw that good Pakistan. I, I'll give you one example. Sorry, if I will take some time. That uh, in 70s, I understand one of my aunts, uh, that was a time when the people were moving to Middle East for work from Pakistan. And that was the time when the Pakistan started radicalizing, actually. So I remember when she came from Libya and she and I was I was a kid. She took me around in Karachi to find an abaya, the black dress uh, they used to wear, and we couldn't find a one single shop in Karachi to find that abaya. Actually, in that time, we have like you know we have everything the the alcohol available, the nightclubs, the beaches are open in seventy really. So I have myself the witness of that and the change. So I used to call like you know. The religion is indirectly proportional to progress, actually. So, like you increase the religion and you reduce your progress, and that is what the society in Pakistan happens. So, that's what my comment was. So, so my my question is even when I moved to Canada, actually, I was I was happy that okay, well, you know, I am I'm free. I can find people from my country back because when you are moving a new country, you tend to live within your diaspora to progress. So people tend to like you know find people from their own country and make bonds together. So so uh, to my surprise actually, I saw 
mostly the Pakistani, they were more religious than what, what I thought they were back in Pakistan, actually. So I just want your, uh, like, your opinion that what was your experience, because I, I, I'm really shocked. Uh, and I couldn't find even one, uh, even few families from, from my partner they are there to, to be more progressive, talking about, like, you know, or, or maybe leaving religion or whatever. I mean, like, that's, uh, so I just want your, uh, like, uh, experience. How did you find that Pakistan diaspora in U.S. actually that, uh, I mean, like, were more progressive, actually, in fact. As you said, like, your doctor groups is like that. Sorry. Yes, please, go ahead. Thank you. Radicalize just like uh, back home. But okay, uh, actually, in Pakistan, people are much like like girls are more modern. People have uh, you know because they're trying to copy the West. They idealize West in Pakistan. In Western world, when they come here, they are so scared of losing uh, their identity because they, it, it's kind of an identity crisis kind of situation. So they try to hold on to their origins or roots so hard that they radicalize their children. They like impose this, you know, hijab on their children and their boys and their cultural, they do cultural festivals and everything so much. They just overdo it. And that's why they are more radical, especially in Britain. Uh, they actually totally destroyed the UK. The Muslim, the this Pakistani Muslims are so backward. You, you would feel like they're stuck in 80s when they moved from during Ziyaz era, when the Taliban's and all this uh, were forming and the, era, the Afghanistan war, Russia was happening. Pakistan was, you know, given so much money and radicalized by Saudis, all these madrasas. They moved to UK at that time and those people are stuck in that era. And same with situation here. <clears throat> the thing is that in UK, Muslims are living in ghettos, like they are, they're more congested. Here, it's not like that, like they're spread out. So they would gather in the mosques and all that, but they're not like living in ghettos here in America because America is like huge. So if they got the opportunity, like some of the, um, Counties in Texas, they have allowed, uh, you know, call to prayer, azan. Some, I think in uh, New York, there is one county where they have allowed call to prayer. So this, they're slowly, you know, encroaching. They're slowly getting there. This is their final agenda to take over the West. And I think Western people are so... Uh, <laughs> nice or like they they believe in multiculturalism and they're like so tolerant especially the left liberal left in the west that they, they don't realize the venom the venomous nature of islam and muslims because this is how they're brainwashed yeah, yeah absolutely right i i yep yeah. i think tushi Thanks. has a question no, no, I'm sorry. I, oh, I, I, I don't want to impose. I, I just wanted to make a comment. I, I, I don't, I don't buy these people being that naive. Some people are naive. People who are um, less, maybe less educated or less powerful, might be naive. But people in power here in Canada know exactly what you're doing. It's money. I, to me, it, it mm -hmm. literally boils down to simple money. Refuge. Well, I wouldn't just say refugees because the frank, the frank of the matter is that people who are coming from the Muslim world come with a lot of money. You know, like we lived in Saudi, no one was paying taxes. I re I mean, we my, you know, my parents were just like my dad was a doctor, like pretty regular stuff. I had classmates who were extraordinarily wealthy, who were coming into Canada, United States, bringing real money out here. And people look the other way. They know, like people in the government here know that they're bringing in money and they just go, OK, well, it is what it is. I'm disconnected from it because, I mean, I'm safe. It'll never really affect me. But Islamism will affect kind of everyone else. When a terror attack happens, it's not going to affect them. So I don't think they're that naive. And I think, to be honest with you, part of sorry, part of my issue with, with Canadians as a quasi-American is that people in Canada here are the people in power are very silent, but they're silent not because they're like so nice to everybody. And you know, that's what they'd have you believe. It's because here in Canada, people don't talk about things because it's easier. It's easier to control people when things aren't talked about. Right, you know, like you know, immigration makes people a lot of money, right? I mean, there's like when when a family comes into Canada, they've got to buy a house, they got to buy a car, they've got to spend money on groceries, entertainment. I mean, this is literal cash infusion into the country. 
So that's why people don't, you know, they look the other way, but they know, they know very well what's going on. Anyway, that's just my no, two cents. You're, sorry, you're absolutely correct. It's very different than Europe because Canada, we've got like ocean, ocean, frozen tundra and the Americans, right? Like we're completely protected. We choose the immigrants. We even choose the refugees that we want to bring in. Do you know that when that Syrian war happened, a lot of the Syrian refugees that they were bringing in were people that were working in Saudi Arabia? Those are the ref these are the Syrian refugees that they were bringing in. It's exactly what you said. Not only is it money, but it's also votes. They're bringing in people that they know are going to support them politically. Um, yeah, so they we we have the 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 privilege in Canada to choose specifically the immigrants that they want to bring in, even the refugees that they want to bring in, the ones with deep pockets. I, I totally agree. It's it is nefarious. Um, and I'm very, I have, if we're going to start talking about Canada, I, I mean, I have so much to say, but the problem is nobody cares about Canada generally on these things, because even though we're such a big country, um, at the end of the day, we really don't have that much political power. Um, but yeah, we're doing, we're doing so much wrong in that country. Lois, do you have something to add to that? <laughs> Another fellow Canadian with us here? Yeah. If you've read my book, then you you know how I feel about Canada and the mess that's happening there. Sorry, Medea, did you want to add to that? I just jumped in there. No, no, you're. I don't know much about Canada either, so you're you're the best. Person. You're not alone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I want Aaliyah, to. You've been. Oh, sorry. I want to applaud the great debates we have here. They're really brilliant. I see we have a debate in the chat about whether we can privatize religion or not. And it's a great debate. Um, I'd like to say a word here. I think everyone who says they believe in God, believe in, what does that mean? In fact, these people are atheists. Uh, and the only people who are not atheists are agnostics who think that it's too dogmatic to either believe or disbelieve in something you don't know. <laughs> So it's, uh, what is believe in? It means suppressing your knowledge that you have no knowledge of this and lying to everyone about it. So it is a public thing. It requires people to lie. It requires them to impose on their own minds to lie to themselves. It requires them to impose on others and to demand from others that they also lie. Uh, and there is a very beautiful line, the final two chapters of John Locke's huge book, The Essay on Human Understanding, uh, the beginning of modern British empiricism. The last two chapters tell you what he's really about. And he says, he who imposes on his own mind will also impose on others. So you can't keep it private very easily. It's much better to keep yeah, it private. We've made I, a rule of that, but it's, it, it keeps trying to break out. <laughs> baby steps, you guys, baby yeah. steps. I agree with you and I agree with Aaliyah, but when I was saying that if they could just keep it in their pants and be more like the Christians, I'm not saying that would be like my ultimate if I had a genie that I could ask for. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying that would be yeah. a wonderful improvement upon Islamic law, upon, you know, forcing people you know in iran you get lashed for drinking alcohol you know we, we don't we don't talk about all we the woman life freedom movement has made the hijab very clear to everybody but there's so much more going on right they force gay people to transition so that way you look like a straight couple publicly you know I mean? there's a lot of horrible shit going on that really is invading people's privacy to the most intimate possible level. Um, so when I say that if they can just keep it out of policy, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm just saying like one step towards progress, right? Towards treating each other like human being, like human beings. But obviously there's, in a perfect world, it would be nice if not everybody believed in absurdities especially dangerous absurdities and Aliyah made a really good point which is even if they're keeping it to themselves they're going to be mutilating their daughter's genitals they're going to be forcing her into child marriage you know what I mean there's all sorts of horrible things that happen behind closed doors and I know that I'm very aware of that and 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 I hope that we can one day 
eradicate all that stuff. But for now, at least, at the very fucking least, when somebody comes to their government and says, my family is doing this to me, if that government can be like, okay, well, that's abuse and I will protect you. Like, at least, let's just start there. And then, you know, we can't expect humans to be perfect at any point in time. There's always going to be people that are going to be abusing their kids in one way or another. Um, Muslims just happen to have, like, divine sanction for the for the abuse that they do so it makes it so much harder to fight and this is why and I got so attacked for this and I'm going to repeat it now so many years later when I said that Islam is worse than Nazism yes I said it again and the reason why I'm saying it is because you can actually look at Nazi following people who follow the Nazi regime and you can convince them you can talk to them you can get them to see the the hate and the error and the, the the horribleness of their ways and of following this terrible ideology and following this terrible man. But when you have Muslims, getting them to be unindoctrinated is so much more difficult because now you're talking about eternity. You know what I mean? Now you're talking about burning like Madiha was describing how hell is described in such detail all of your flesh is going to come off and then it's going to come back and then it's going to go blah, blah, and then just like you know ad nauseum for the rest of time um that's what you're up against so it's so much harder to unindoctrinate a muslim than it is to unindoctrinate a nazi and that's why i was saying that that it's worse i don't even know how i got there <laughs> that was a rant that took a turn but anyway, um, Aliyah, you have so many comments in the chat, and I don't want to hang hey. out before you have a chance to to, to speak. Sure. Hey, um, I I have a uh, question. Um, well, I have a couple of thoughts followed by a um, question. But I'm really glad to be here. I haven't been part of these podcasts for a, for for a while. Um, thank you for Madiha um, for coming in. Um, so I think it was okay. First off, I'm just going to say I do recognize my privilege of being here in the West, of being, you know, an, uh, an uh, American, but we all have privileges wherever we are, certain privileges, right? If I speak about Islam, my government is not going to attack me, but the closest people, right, uh, the, the relatives and the family who has raised me, the community, they are the ones who I have to watch out for. Right. Um, that being said, I'm going to take it back to Pakistan. Right. Um, Madia, it was it was really interesting when you said you don't like to use the label of ex-Muslim. I'm not big into labels as well, but you said that it's because it triggers it triggers Muslims. Now, when are we going to stop appeasing and tip, you know, kind of tiptoeing around Muslims, you know, hope, because to be realistic, everything will trigger them. You know, uh, criticizing Islam is in any way, bringing Islam into anything will be a big trigger um, for for these people. So, like, how do what do you think are some of the ways that um, you know um, you 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 are Pakistani? How you know um, Pakistani women like yourself could tap into the mindsets? Um, of these uh, feminists, right? Um, the Aura uh, March um, feminists. How could you tap into the mindsets of these women um, to kind of like wake them up? Because I remember I've been into, I, I don't attend a lot of Pakistani spaces for good reasons, but I did attend um, the Aura March um, space, a couple of, of them. And I and I am a person who who's not shy on my you know beliefs and my opinions. So of course I I brought up Islam. I was shut down completely. They were saying no 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 no. It's it's the men who have taken our rights. Islam is so beautiful. Islam is so beautiful. And Alia, you don't know. You just don't know what what Islam is. Our 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 Rasul was blah blah blah. You know he gave us such rights in Islam. 
it's it's kind of like I'm kind of like looking at this and saying these these women are just not going to win because they're not you know <laughs> they're not they're not even touching tapping the root of this issue now a lot of people are going to be listening to me and they're going to think well she has such privilege she's sitting in the west you know speaking about islam in a muslim nation and a muslim country is you know that is a death sentence but 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 then how is change going to be made right like people have to start somewhere right and i think if, a, if enough people come together and they have like this one strong voice, I'm, I'm, I'm again going to, you know, um, um, use uh, the Iranian girls and, and women as an example. There's just certain sacrifices that you have to make for uh, freedom, right? And ha- for how long are girls and pa- Pakistani girls and women, you know, um, Muslim women are just going to stay silent because of fear? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I, yeah. I'm not saying that the word ex-Muslim is bad. I'm just saying that uh, once you uh, use the word ex-Muslim, you know how you're treated like you're an alien. You're like, Absolutely. you're lost your mind. You, you're, you know, so I want them at least listen to what we are saying without triggering. But anyways, now it's out there. I'm already have done. I've already done so many interviews with ex-Muslims. Everybody knows I'm an ex-Muslim. I put it on Facebook. So it's just like in the beginning, I was a little reluctant to use the term. I thought maybe atheist word would sink better first. You know, you tell them atheist and all that you don't believe. And then ex-Muslim, but it's out there. Yeah, you're you're right. There, anything you say will trigger them. Anything you talk about Islam, you talk about Quran, you talk as long as you're like you know the saying the what Arat Marsh women are saying. Oh, Islam gives us right, but you know the men don't give us right. You blame it, or Islam is beautiful. Muslims are bad. As long as you tow these lines, they're okay with it. Like you know, Islam good, Muslim bad. Muslims are the product of Islam. This is they're, they're they're the way they are because of Islam's. So people don't make they have this uh, dissociation or whatever compartmentalization that they don't uh, want to take blame on like put blame on Islam somehow. They they are willing to take blame on themselves to protect Islam. This is how bad the brainwashing is. So you're right. No matter what you do, whatever way you want to. But I wanted to penetrate through this female diaspora, Muslim, female, brainwashed, extremely, extremely brainwashed. They're so hard to, I've seen so many Muslim, um, ex-Muslim men, so many, like maybe the ratio would be 100 to 1 or maybe more than 1,000 to 1 for women. It's that bad. I don't know. They're, they pay special attention to women to brainwash them to Islam. They're singing praises more than men of Islam. They're doing rituals more than men. They're going to umrahs more than men. I don't know why, what, what Islam gives, you know, to them. So, yeah. Yeah. One of the people that I'm going to be having on this podcast soon is an Australian woman who was converted to Islam through these Dawa boys. So we'll delve into that a bit deeper then. Um, Medea, I want to thank you so much for the couple of hours that you gave us here. I really appreciate it. I know everybody here has really appreciated your wonderful voice and sharing your stories and being so honest with us. Um, before we go, I just want to give you an opportunity to just give the last word. Is there anything you want to tell us, like where we can follow you on YouTube um, or just a, a word of advice to us? Or, you know, I just want you to, to conclude this session. Thank you so much. It's uh, great to be here and see other people who are like-minded. I'm, I'm like so glad that you have this platform where all of you share your ideas and thoughts. I have a YouTube channel, Madhya Talks, but it's in Urdu, so most of you would not understand. That's why I didn't mention it. But I mean, I'm glad. I just think we need to all join forces and make like more open public maybe get news media you know something like they they should be writing articles how how fast ex-muslims are growing how why people they should like share our stories like they should make a documentary like if somebody has 
uh, in touch, if somebody is in contact with somebody like in media, they should like put these documentaries on CNN or Netflix that people are leaving Islam, that so uh, the, to normalize this dissent and normalize talking about Islam because Islam has enjoyed this uh, umbrella of protection for a very long time when no, we're nobody because not because Islam is a peaceful religion it's because Islam Muslims kill people like we know what they did to Sulman Rushdie so and now we should like openly talk about it that normalize the dissent normalize criticizing Islam and exposing so this is what thank you everybody for your question and for listening to me thank you thank you so much Madiha and I just wanted to let you know that there is a documentary currently being made about ex-Muslims, so hopefully it will be out soon and people will actually watch it. Um, Sarah's going to be in it. And um, yeah, so hopefully people will be interested in, in listening to our stories. I completely agree, though. You know, we do need to get our voices out there and nobody's going to do it for us. We have to do it for ourselves. OK, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful, you know, rest of the day wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us and I look forward to seeing you the next time. Take care everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Madiha.